John Nelson Darby was a hyperdispensationalist. So I would not respond to them before I asked them questions. I'd like them to respond to the questions. My first question is this. The modern academic patriarch of pre-tribulationism by their own recognition in scholarly circles is the, the former president of Dallas Seminary, Dr. John Wilbert, who is now with the Lord, but he's a more modern figure. In his book on the rapture, he admits, he states that there is no passage of scripture, none, that teaches a pre-tribulational rapture. It's not in there according to Dr. John Wolverd, the academic patriarch of modern pre-tribulational scholarship from Dallas Seminary. Major pre-tribulationists all follow this line of thinking. It came from Charles Ryrie and others. Dr. Wolverd was honest. It's not in there. We have exegesis and asegesis, taking out of the scripture what God put in there and reading something into it it doesn't say. We have inductive, dealing with what the text says, and deductive, some kind of sanctified opinion. Therefore, it must be this. We can only base doctrine on exegesis, rightly dividing the word of God, and on induction, what the text actually says. But John Wolverd admits this is not possible concerning a pre-tribulational rapture. It's an opinion. It's a deduction. He says it's something you have to glean from an overview because no particular passage teaches it. Why do you commit yourself to a belief in the timing of the rapture when there is no plain passage of scripture that supports it according to Dr. Wolverine and most of the people who follow him and most serious pre-trib theologians agree. Why are you basing a doctrine on something not plainly stated? The great doctrines of our faith, including the doctrine that Christ shall return, are all plainly stated. Why would such a truth not be plainly stated if it were true? Now, some have tried to say it is plainly stated, but their argumentation is rather ridiculous. We have people with, I don't mean this offensively, phony doctorates, doctorates from non-accredited institutions, calling themselves doctor when their doctorates are not credible, not recognized, not real. One of which is Thomas Ice. I know Thomas Ice, and I do not dislike him, but he's very committed to a certain interpretation of pre tribulations He goes to the extent of saying the rapture is plainly stated. It's the apostasy, the apostasia, the falling away. It is the rapture. Now, that term, as I've said on other recordings, is almost hapex legemini. Apostasia is almost Apex legemini, something that occurs only one place. The underlying word is epistemi, to stand out of, to stand out of. In Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, but the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, so it's in an eschatological last days context, the same as 2 Thessalonians, where the apostasy is, that some will apostatize, some will fall away we plainly see, interpreting Scripture in light of Scripture, the other place, the term with slight variation in the Greek, but it's the same essential term, occurs, and occurs in a last day's prophetic context, eschatologically, it says it's a departure from belief, a falling away from what people used to believe. Now, Traditional pre-tribulation people taught this. They all believed the apostasy was a great falling away at the end of the age. Challenging Thomas Ice, the leading debater of the pre-trib research society, a research society, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, a lawyer and a theologian, 
stated that if this were talking about the rapture, the word would be harpezo, not apostasia, not apostasy. It's a ridiculous length. Traditional pre-tribulational people never believed that the apostasy was the rapture. How can it possibly be the rapture? Other pre-trib people don't believe it. Traditional pre-trib did not believe it. When 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, tells us it means falling away from the faith, not being raptured. My second question. Others have tried to say it is in there based on Revelation chapter 3, the message to the church of Philadelphia, that Philadelphia would be raptured uh, and not go through the tribulation. Well, the word there is peresmos, peresmos. I will keep you from the hour of testing. How do they know the hour of testing <clears throat> is the tribulation instead of the wrath of God? We have two different Greek words, as we've said often, that pre-tribulation people try to make synonyms, but they're not synonymous. The word thalipsis is tribulation, and then you have megathalipson, the great tribulation, and then you have the word for the wrath of God, orge. We're not appointed unto wrath. And so Jesus tells them in verse 10 of chapter 3 of Revelation, because you've kept the word of my hupomony, perseverance, I'll keep you from the hour of peresmos. How can peresmos be tribulation? Uh, when Jesus tells this church that it's going to be in tribulation, he tells this church, I know your deeds, I know what you've gone through, I know about your suffering, and I know that you've persevered. You've persevered. What are they persevering through? They're persevering through what Revelation chapters 13 and 14 says. They're persevering through the opposition they will face at the hands of the Antichrist. It's the same word, hupomoni. This is the megathalipson, the great tribulation. It is not the wrath of God. The faithful church does not experience the wrath of God. But this church needed that hupomony. That term hupomony, we're told in Revelation, is what will be required to confront and resist the Antichrist just before the rapture. They have no exegetical argument to say that Revelation 3.10 is they're going to be kept from the Great Tribulation. There's nothing in the context of the verse, the passage, or the book of Revelation exegetically that would support that. They always must divert to asegesis, to hermeneutics, to methods of biblical interpretation that they themselves would oppose in other areas. If other people used those same methods and read things into the text that didn't say, many pre-tribulational people would oppose it, yet they engage in the same thing themselves that they oppose elsewhere. My next question is, on what basis can you say that wrath and tribulation are the same when they're two different words used in two different contexts? How can you believe the rapture is the apostasy? if you're following Thomas Ice, Traditional preacher people do not even believe that. In other words, you have a division in the pre-tribulation camp. My next question is this. Concerning the Episunagage, the return of Jesus, the rapture and resurrection, it speaks of this in 2 Thessalonians and in Revelation, and then Daniel, as something happening in concert with the manifestation of the Antichrist or the Antichrist and false prophet. That is for sure, that is clear. It unites the two subjects. The return of Jesus in light of the Antichrist. He will not come until the man of lawlessness is revealed. 
That's what it plainly states. That is what it plainly states. Pre-tribulational people have to do every kind of somersault or monkey trick to get around the plain meaning. Why are you doing somersaults and monkey tricks to get around what's plainly stated in the text? That the rapture will not happen until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. Revelation tells us, let he who has wisdom count the number of the beast. Well, they tell us <clears throat> in pre-tribulational circles, well, that's the tribulation saints. The tribulation saints have wisdom? If the pre-tribulation saints had wisdom, it's one thing. But if the post-rapture saints have wisdom, the tribulation saints, oh. if those people had wisdom who are here after the rapture, they would have been raptured. They wouldn't be here either. It's ridiculous. If the tribulation saints had wisdom, they would have been raptured. They wouldn't be here either. It's a ridiculous argument. It's telling us, us, the church as it exists, to be faithful and know how to identify him by his actions and by the number of his name. That's what it plainly states. Tell me on what basis can you say forget that and don't worry about the Antichrist? Well, let's see what happens when people forget that and don't worry about the Antichrist. Let's look at your pre-trib leaders. Jesus warned there'd be many Antichrists. One self-confessed Antichrist was Sun Young Moon, the Korean cult leader of the Unification Church. He not only said he was the return of Christ, the Lord of the Second Advent, and that Jesus failed in his mission, he said his wife, now deceased, was the Holy Spirit. This is an Antichrist. Yet Tim LaHaye tried to organize 300 evangelical leaders to volunteer to go to federal prison in solidarity with Sung Young Moon, an antichrist. He tried to support an antichrist. When Moon was indicted and convicted and sent to federal prison, Tim LaHaye tried to organize 300 evangelical leaders to support him and volunteer to go to prison with him in solidarity with a self-confessed antichrist who said his wife was the Holy Spirit. This is madness. Jerry Falwell took a couple of million dollars in contributions from Sun Young Moon for Liberty University. But then, it wasn't the ravens feeding Elijah. He publicly embraced this antichrist and called him an unsung hero. Yet, Dr. Ed Hinson of Liberty University didn't utter a word in protest. Forget about what Paul said about the Antichrist and the connection between the identification of the Antichrist and the rapture. We can embrace Antichrist. We can go to prison to support them. We should support them. We should be in solidarity with them. We should take money from them and call them heroes. These are pre-trib leaders. We are told that those who take the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, the smoke of their torment goes up and yow, tau and yawnes, forever and ever. In Hebrew, it would be orame oramim. You worship the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast. The smoke of your torment goes up forever and ever. David Reagan, the pre-trib leader, says, no, that's not true. Hell's only a place of annihilation. It's not eternal and conscious. He's an annihilationist. John MacArthur says, it will be possible to worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, and still be saved. So does Jimmy D. Young. Boy, to tell. Yeah, absolutely. Top of it. Uh, I've got a surprise for you today. Okay. Do you remember when you talked about the uh, someone asked uh, about the mark of the beast and whether or not someone could receive the mark of the beast and then become a believer? You remember that? Uh huh. Do you remember the controversy that stirred up? Yes. It was quite a bit, wasn't it? It was. I got a lot of emails, people saying, "I can't believe he would say such a thing." 
You remember all that? Yes, sir, I do. All right. Well, I was walking April the other night listening to a Q&A uh, from a few years ago uh, where Pete, John MacArthur on a Wednesday night lets, would have the folks in his congregation stand up and go to the microphones and shoot questions at him. Would you like to hear the question he was asked and his answer? <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we go. In regard to the about a half of the tribulation period when, when men would be required to have the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell, my question is, uh, once a person takes the mark, is there any possibility of him coming to Christ? Yes. Uh, I think, you know, in, in the seven-year tribulation coming in the future, we're going to get into this so probably a week from Sunday night, maybe this Sunday night, maybe a week, I'm not sure. But... Um, the tribulation is a seven-year period, right? The rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation, then Christ returns, sets up his kingdom. Now, in that seven-year period, really two things happen. God begins to judge the world in, with a series of holocausts, and at the same time, he begins to redeem his people, Israel. And in the process of this, the Antichrist establishes his rule, and in order to function in the economy of the Antichrist, you have to take the mark of the beast. Uh, the mark being the number of a man, Revelation 13, 666, six is the number of man, right? Seven is the number of perfection, and man always falls short of perfection. Six, 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 six. Always six is never seven. So the number of man. And apparently what's going to happen, you take the mark on your hand or on your forehead. And we've talked a lot about that, you know, that, uh, that that's kind of the computer situation. We're now moving fast toward the time when we're going to have to do everything we do by cards and by numbers and all of that. And uh, uh, those number, the thing about a card that's a problem is you lose it, and they've already devised systems to put the number on your hand and on your forehead, and you go through a scanner, and, then, you know, that's how you buy and sell. It's automatically deducted from your bank account. Now, the question is, if you're living in the tribulation period, and you take this mark, in other words, you identify with the beast's empire, Will you still be able to be redeemed? And I think the answer to that is yes. Yes. Otherwise, there would be no salvation of anybody in the end of the tribulation. And you've got to have the salvation of folks in the end of the tribulation. You're going to have the Jews redeemed. You're going to have, according to Revelation chapter 7, an innumerable number of Gentiles redeemed, so many they can't even be counted across the face of the earth. So I don't think the fact that someone takes that is a sentence to, it, to permanency any more than you being a part of this world system once in your life means you have to be a part of the system all your life. Well, especially when the 144,000 don't start their ministry till the second half. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That make it a little tough. Yeah. Well, there you go, Dr. DeYoung. <laughs> well, we're looking at the same book. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what's so interesting, and that's what we were saying. I mean, you know, that's not the impartable sin. You've got to be... I, the thought, I, I've never thought that what he said there was very interesting. The fact is, if nobody gets saved in the last three and a half years because they have received that mark, where's that uh, unbelievable number of Jews that come to know Christ and that are living, that actually go into the millennial kingdom in natural bodies? That's good that uh, Brother John is looking at the same book that I am, and we came up with the same answers. Well, it is, and that was very interesting because you remember that was really, really controversial. I don't, I'm not so sure you've ever made a statement on our program before that was as controversial as that one. And I got so many emails on it, and uh, and then I was walking the dog the other night listening to this Q and A, and I thought, oh, I've got to play this on the air. This this will be a great surprise for Dr. DeYoung. So there well, you go. it is a pleasant surprise, and. Uh, the dear brothers and sisters who disagreed, you know, I don't quite know where they were coming from. I, I don't need to know that. But just uh, now, with uh, that confirmation from another uh, Bible teacher, and he's a great Bible teacher. I'm just a beginner. but uh, No, the, I wouldn't the, say that, but go <laughs> but, on. <laughs> uh, it's great to see that and the confirmation of both of us believing that same thing. I wonder how many more emails you're going to get now. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. you got two guys on your side that are pretty good, right? <laughs> I think so, too. I think so, too. Yeah. Well, uh, we both love you and love what you're doing and have the opportunity to interact on your program. Well, the feeling's mutual. Thank you. Phil Johnson supports this. These are major pre-trib leaders. How can you trust and follow and believe people who say it will be possible to take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist and still be saved and go to heaven. How can you believe a man like MacArthur? He's lost his mind. You can worship the Antichrist and take the mark. The smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever. No, that's wrong. There's no eternal hell. It's not conscious, says David Reagan.
that you understand Tim LaHaye, David Reagan, Ed Hinson, John MacArthur, Jimmy DeYoung, Phil Johnson. These are the major, major pre-trib leaders. How can you follow such men? My next question. John Darby was a hyper-dispensationalist. His hermeneutics were Marcionite, from the ancient Marcians. He did not believe in the false Christology of the Marcionites, but he certainly had their method of misinterpreting the scripture. John Darby says, the Sermon on the Mount is for Israel. It's for unsaved Jews. It's not for Christians. John Darby says, the Epistle of James is not for believers. It's only for Israel. It's part of the Old Testament. This is his hermeneutic. He helped engender the rise of Bollingerism that came from Bollinger, who was opposed aptly in America by Harry Ironside, who was himself dispensational. Bollinger basically said, it's only the book of Acts and the epistles that are for the church. The Gospels are for Israel. The Gospels are not for us as believers. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's not for us. This is hyper-dispensationalism. This is Bullingerism. The way that John Darby gets around the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and its plain meaning and its plain reading is the same way. He says it's not for the church, it's for Israel. <laughs> How can you believe him? Do you believe the Sermon on the Mount is not for the church? Do you believe the Epistle of James is not for Christians? Well, that's the same twisted method of misinterpreting, butchering the Word of God that Darby engages in to get around Matthew 24 and what it says about the rapture. You're subscribing to hyper-dispensationalism. Do you believe that? Well, if you believe what Darby said about Matthew 24, you have to believe what he said about the Sermon on the Mount and the Epistle of James. Do you? It has become more crazy. Because of Dr. Wolver stating admitting that there is no passage. You've had people like Thomas Ice trying to say there is, the apostasy is the rapture, or people like Jan Markell trying to say the message to Revelation shows the church won't be in tribulation, even though those people need and have had hoopamony to persevere in tribulation. But then you have other people saying, okay, it's not in there. We admit Dr. Wolbert is correct. However, we don't just base doctrine on reading the scriptures literally. We have to extrapolate it. That's nonsense. Anybody can extrapolate anything subjectively. T.A. McMahon and Dr. Paul Wilkinson in England state the following. <coughs> now, Dave Hunt would turn over in his grave. He never would have approved of this, <clears throat> what T.A. McMahon is doing. He says, the Trinity is not literally stated in Scripture, and we believe it. Therefore, the rapture is the same. It's not literally stated, but we believe it as a doctrine. That is a teaching of the Jehovah's Witness cult. That would be music to the ears of any Jehovah's Witness. The Jehovah's Witnesses would have Paul Wilkinson tickling this ear and T.A. McMahon tickling this one. They'd love to hear that about the Trinity. Well, in the morning of them is Stephen. There's the Holy Spirit, and then there's Jesus at the right hand of the Father. We see the triunity. Jesus not only explained that there was a triunity, but he explained the dynamics of the relationship within the triunity in John chapters 14 through 17. 
baptizing them in the name, not names, name, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The idea that the triunity, the trinity, is not literally stated in Scripture is a Jehovah's Witness lie that has now been borrowed by the Berean call of all people. When Dave Hunt was alive, the Berean call was the pillar, was the standard of upholding biblical truth. Unbelievable. Paul Wilkinson and T.A. McMahon are resorting to Jehovah's Witness teaching to try to justify teaching as a doctrine something not plainly stated. Well, Thomas Ice and Jan Markell are reading things into the scripture not even stated. This is most unfortunate that the rapture is, 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 there is, uh, the, is, is the apostasy. No. Do you agree with this? I'm asking preacher people. Do you agree with what they are doing? How can you agree? Do you think that we can base doctrine on things not plainly stated? Do you think that the rapture is like the Trinity? The Trinity is not taught? <clears throat> and the rapture is not taught directly, but we believe them? That's nonsense. The Trinity is taught directly. A pre-trib rapture is not. The rapture is taught directly. The rapture is literally stated. <laughs> but not a pre-trib rapture. What do you do with Mr. Darby himself? Remember, the major evangelical luminaries of the time publicly warned against him. Charles Spurgeon took out full-page ads in newspapers warning against Darby. Spurgeon said he was a religious despot and a false teacher. George Mueller, the great George Mueller, opposed and was opposed by Darby. James Grant was another one. Dr. Uh, Benjamin Trigalis was another one. The eminent Greek scholar, a far more learned man in biblical languages and, and, and exegesis than Mr. Darby. Now, many of these people were brethren from the brethren movement themselves. Certainly, Benjamin Newton was, I'm sorry, Dr. Samuel Trigalis was. George Mueller was. These were brethren themselves. These were dispensationalists themselves. But they were not hyper-dispensationalists like Darby. Spurgeon said he was a dangerous, false teacher and a despot. My question is this. <laughs> this was a time when the Millerites had their cognitive dissonance based on their false predictions of the return of Christ in the 19th century. Many cults sprung up at that time, the first being the Mormons. But after the Millerites, it increased. The Seventh-day Adventists was one such cult. Another such cult became known as the Dawn's Bible Society that quickly morphed into what we call the Jehovah's Witnesses in Pittsburgh. A third were the exclusive brethren, the closed brethren. The closed brethren are a confused cult. Darby attempted to mix dispensationalism and hyper-dispensationalism with Reformed theology. There is nothing more anti-dispensational than infant baptism, than sprinkling babies. But Darby's cult sprinkles babies. That's covenant theology. That's not dispensational. He was a confused man. His cult exists to this day. They're immersed in exclusivism. They are the one true church. They consider the other brethren to be heretical. They call them the Bethesda. They don't like them. They always go back to Darby's conflicts with Benjamin Newton and these people in the 19th century. They're a cult. We had a lady who was in it 34 years in England who was born again. She thought she was saved and a Christian because she'd been baptized as an infant in Darby's cult. They're a cult. They destroy families and marriages like any other cult. John Nelson Darby was a cult leader. He founded a cult. 
at a time when other cults of the similar ontogeny sprung up. Among them, among them, Seventh-day Adventism with Ellen G. White and the Dawn's Bible Society, with, which became the Jehovah's Witnesses of the Charles Tazzy Russell. Well, the close brethren were just another cult. You're following a cult leader. Ask people in England about the closed brethren. Ask believers. They'll tell you it's a cult. It's darkness. They had leaders who were immoral men like Jim Taylor and others. Came from Darby. He founded a cult. And it still exists. Why are you following the teachings of a cult leader? Why are you saying that Matthew 24 is not for, for, the, for the church, only for unbelieving Israel. That was Darby's hermeneutic. Then you're also saying the epistle of James and the Sermon on the Mount and much of the gospels are not for the church. It's heretical. Then we move forward. Most Americans or North Americans who are pre-trib <clears throat> are influenced by Cyrus Schofield. Well, let's look at Cyrus Schofield. Please answer these questions. You don't owe me the answer. You do not owe me any answers. You owe me nothing. But answering these questions is something that before the Lord, you owe to yourself. Thank you for listening. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.